And so when I say Chinese, I want you to scream out the, na the nation that's associated with this. For example, if I say Chinese, you gotta say what? China. All right, let's say it with authority. When I say Chinese, you say what? China. All right, that's just a, a test right there. So here we go. Chinese. China. Russian. Russia. Italian. Italy. German. German. Swedish. Swedish. Korean. Korea. Egyptian. Egypt. Nigerian. I hope you were able to successfully identify the issue. The lion won't sleep tonight. And we woke now. And we woke now. I said the lion won't To sell our souls to barter profit Like God's property It's hard to market So we steady the aim Keep your eyes on target Cause when you got the drive Yeah, they'd rather you park it But I don't valet You ain't getting these keys I'm keeping closed hands I'm on bending knee I'm just a reflection Dealing with eight sections Art mixed with life You can feel the convection You're lying, won't sleep tonight Cause we woke now If you cannot speak um, and have talk about the history of who they are, um, then they will not really carry your story. They will not understand their story. So today, the first thing I, I, I was the greatest revelation I was telling you a while back um, is that most people trying to reach, and I'm going to specifically talk today, and next week will be Spanish, the following week the Asian, etc. But I'm going to talk to specifically today about the black culture. And I wanted to right now, I know, and how many would agree, that I am not black? Can I get a witness, everybody? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Pretty, pretty white to me. Can I get a amen up in here? Yeah. Mm, praise God. Amen. So here's the deal. But what I want to share with you is I want to talk to you about is that, you know, we went across the country and we found out there's certain things that help reach that culture and reach it effectively, and there's certain things that don't make it happen, Okay. And today, I would like to talk about those things that do reach the culture, specifically in the men of the culture. And the first thing I found out is this. I found out that they do not know their history. That's one of the things that I know. And so you have to tell them their history. So today, I'm going to attempt to do that. The same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color, have told us what it means to be black. He's now positioned in a seat of a position of power and authority. He has given within him a belt. On one side is justice, and the other is blessing. He now is given the constitution of God as a king. I give this to you, Bishop, as a sign of covenant, as a sign of release, as my sign of love for you. Amen. My brothers will come forth. Four sons representing the four corners of the earth. They'll raise him up right now. He now is raised up from a commoner to a kingship. Come on, raise it up. And I'll walk him around. The same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black. The 
white man is enacting a story all over the world. Mm -hmm. we, we left our homes and flooded the world. We smothered culture. We smothered knowledge. We erased history and rewrote it our way. Myself, I'm 100. Or my grandfather is 100 percent Ashkenazi Jewish, claiming to be Jewish. Ashkenazi Jewish is just a conspiracy. White men claiming to be of tribes of Israel when I'm Germanic, you know, I, yeah. I have no ties to Israel, no ties to Judaism, you know, except, except loosely written history that's been whitewashed over for centuries, mm. and, you know. It's, From the Renaissance. Oh yeah, right, you just, you, you wipe everything clean, it's funny how, it's, exactly, the Renaissance, it's this rebirth, but it's, it's white rebirth. I think at the same exact time the Renaissance is happening, Columbus is sailing to America Committing genocide. There's only one true ethnic Jew, the Mizrahi Jew, because they are Africans, and if you read the original Bible written in Phoenician Hebrew, they're not. Jewish people are not Europeans. The modern Jews in Israel are Russians from, or Khazars to be precise, <laughs> from Russia. I learned it from my grandfather that he was, a, cause he was an Ashkenazi Jew. The same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black. You know, you know what you are? You are an ancient Israelite. Ancient Israelite, that's who we are. I'm telling you, that's who we are. So give me time. Yeah. Give me time. But, 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 no, 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 no. We don't have. So many years. I know. I know. Look, look at this. This is pages and pages of yes. notes. And I promise we'll give yes. more teaching. But here is my challenge to you. All right. I'm hearing some of your traditions. It's like the days of the Bible. Yes. Do you want to remain ancient Israelites, or you want to be Jews? Do you want to remain ancient Israelites? Or you want to be Jews? Do you want to remain ancient Israel? I'm hearing some of your traditions. It's like the days of the Bible. Yes. Do you want to remain ancient Israelites? Or you want to be Jews? That is the question I have for you. Thank you. I'll answer that question. Go, Go ahead. ahead. I will help you. After the demise of Solomon, we now have the northern and southern kingdom of Israel. Yes. So when we talk about Jews, Jews are Israelites, but all Israelites are not Jews. The ten tribes that got lost are not Jews. They were Israelites. Jews are Israelites, but all Israelites are not Jews. The ten tribes that got lost are not Jews. They were Israelites. Jews are Israelites, but all Israelites are not Jews. The ten tribes that got lost are not Jews. They were Israelites. So when we talk about Jews, Jews are Israelites, but all Israelites are not Jews. The ten tribes that got lost are not Jews. They were Israelites. Well, it's depending. So uh, the well, well, minority cannot swallow the majority. We are here. We are the majority <laughs> down here. So you are minority, and we are older than you. I, I'm, I'm so glad you're here because you can bring great clarity. Can you tell us a little bit about the Sephardic Jews and how they were scattered because um, they went west? I sure can. Because the reason why I want to is because a lot of them, and a lot of people don't know this, are in the Caribbean. They are. In the islands. I and know you're that. one of them. I and know I'm that. one of them. <laughs> I know that. Uh, because, you know, a lot of folk don't know that the, those roots are there. One of the first um, batches of slaves that came to Jamaica, they were the Sephardic Jews. It's documented. And they're all over, the, they're Caribbean, all over the Caribbean, South America, Central America, yeah. and even the central, South Central United States. Wow. And DNA testing is a factor in all this now. The same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black. להתחיל לאסוף את המסתננים, לא צריך לחכות לבג"ץ, לא צריך שום דבר! אני רואה חרא מחוץ לבית שלי, יריקות, פסיכופטים, אנשים שרק מחפשים איך לרצוח אותי בעיניים שלהם, אבל אף אחד לא מאמין לנו, אנחנו גזענים, אנחנו גזענים 
כדי לרצות לשמור על החיים שלנו ועל השפיעות שלנו. אז אני גאה בלהיות גזענית! אני גאה בלהיות גזענית! אם אני גזענית בשביל לשמור על החיים שלי, אז אני גאה! The same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black. Most Egyptologists and anthropologists, archaeologists of the Eurocentric persuasion will say that uh, Egypt is in Africa. They had to concede that, but then they still draw the line by saying that uh, they weren't Africans like that. In other words, they weren't dark-skinned people. And of course, this is all part of the great deception. And the reality is that if they give up Egypt, ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, if, if they give that up and say that that was a part of black Africa, then they will also have to give up Israel. And that's why they draw the line at Egypt, because if they give up Egypt, they've got to give up Israel. Now, we're going to go over here, and I'm going to show you where Israel sits on the African tectonic plate, which means that Israel is northeast Africa. Now, when we look at this map, this is the, this is the Sinai, okay? This is the Red Sea. This is Egypt. This is the Sinai. This is Israel. All right, this is Saudi Arabia over here. Now, if you see this in Hebrew, it says Haluak Afrikani, the African plate. Here it is right here. Israel is sitting right here. Israel is sitting on the Haluak Afrikani, which means that Israel is Northeast Africa. Uh, without question, we are in Northeast Africa. We are landlocked to Egypt, with the exception of the Suez Canal, which was a man-made uh, ditch, a boundary now uh, between, in fact, it's not even really a boundary anymore since uh, Egypt has reclaimed the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, but nevertheless, even those of us who are Pan-Africanists in our thinking and Afrocentric, we forget and we leave off that portion of Northeast Africa and, and, and don't want to claim anything beyond that. Europeans! classified this area as a Middle East, you know, and then since this the Middle East, the other question, where the Middle West, where the Middle North, and where the Middle South? They don't have no geographical terms like that. <laughs> Their bones were discovered in Kafsay Caves near Nazareth in Galilee in 1933. 13 fragile skeletons, one a woman, a tiny baby at her feet. When these bones were first uncovered, they were the oldest complete modern human skeletons ever found. But the CT scan has one more surprise for Alejandro. Shamai's ethnicity. Well... They have just told me that uh, Shemai has a Nubian feature, which means that um, their ruling family was probably Nubian, and th that was unexpected. Examining Shemai's anatomy closely, the thickness of his bones and the shape of his nasal cavity, the anthropologists think he was a black African, likely from neighboring Nubia. A huge revelation that challenges the prevailing image of the Egyptian ruling class. We always thought the ancient Egyptian elites were Mediterranean type. We always thought the ancient Egyptian elites were Mediterranean type. We always thought the ancient Egyptian elites were Mediterranean type. We always thought the ancient Egyptian elites were Mediterranean type. And in this sense, Shemai is representing the society of, uh, of the frontier in which different ethnic uh, groups 
were mixed. At the end, it doesn't matter the color of your skin. Shemai was Egyptian. At the end, it doesn't matter the color of your skin. Shemai was Egyptian. At the end, it doesn't the same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black. We uh, would not know how to live on the Sabbath if it were not for the oral law. Uh, we would not know uh, what the laws of, the dietary laws of Kashrut are if it were not for the oral law. We would not know what the uh, the feeling what the boxes on our arms and heads that we wear every morning in our prayer service, what they're supposed to be. And in fact, all of Judaism would be uh, completely mysterious, it would be voodoo, if it were not for the oral law. Genesis chapter 11 verse 10 explains the genealogy of Shem. Shem was a black man in Africa. If you repeat this fact, they can't laugh at you. If you repeat this fact, they can't laugh at you. If you repeat this fact, they can't laugh at you. Say peace everyone. Want to say peace and blessings to everyone. Not sure what's going on with StreamYard. For some reason, I am having, look like I'm having some technical issues again. I should have launched my StreamYard with a different browser, should have used a different browser. Uh, but if uh, we get disconnected, uh, don't, don't worry. I can reconnect. Wouldn't be a problem with me reconnecting to uh, the presentation under a new browser. So hopefully uh, this will hold. Uh, like I said, um, you know, having some issues look like it froze up on me a few times. But again, uh, we'll uh, take it little by little. We'll, we'll get past it. Uh, but again, my apologies for, uh, you know, the, the the delay tonight had a lot going on. So before we get started, just want to give you guys a heads up. Uh, this lesson is going to be broken up into two parts. Let me say that again. This lesson is going to be broken up into two parts because there is so much to cover in this lesson. And I really want to walk you through step by step, uh, little by little through the entire process. Right. I want you to really understand uh, how did we have these terms that many are using today when it comes to uh, when we use the term or some use the term second exodus. Uh, some of the other terms, law return and all those things. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Don't want to prolong the lesson because we had a lot that we're going to cover tonight. And just to give you a heads up, tonight will be hev uh, heavily based on what many would refer to as the Old Testament. Uh, we all know those that are, uh, you know, astute in this uh, the Hebrew culture. We know that there's no such thing as an Old Testament that is something that was inserted and created, coined. When you start understanding Tertullian, uh, second and third century, there was no such thing as an Old Testament. There was no such thing as a New Testament. It was referred to as the law and the prophets. I like to refer to them collectively as the established covenant. And then when we look at the testimonies of the disciples of, of the Messiah, you know, those are referred to as what it, what we what I just said, the testimonies. Right. And the letters of Apostle Paul and, of course, letters of the disciples as well. And then, of course, the the uh, the, the prophecies of John. So, again, I don't like using the term old and new. And I want to start off by uh, prefacing this lesson by saying and stating words have meaning. Words have meaning. 
And I believe that uh, leaders have done a terrible job with really teaching uh, these foundational things that we go over here, we cover here. This is why we get a lot of opposition. This is why we have a lot of people uh, want to run with whatever narratives they want to run with, because uh, apparently, you know, it may inf infringe on some of what they're teaching. It's not done, uh, you know, uh, how can I put it intentionally? I'm dealing with doctrine today, like I always do tonight, and I'm not targeting any specific any group of people so i want to put that disclaimer out before we get started i am not targeting any um, particular group of people i'm dealing with doctrine i'm dealing we're just going to go right through uh these notes for tonight so let's go ahead and get started uh, i know i uh, had a much longer than the norm uh intro but it's all good and then as we progress in this lesson we will uh you know i would ask uh, questions and we'll give shout outs along the way. So if you're not, uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, uh, I encourage you guys click the like and subscribe to the channel. When I encourage you guys click the like and subscribe to the channel. Also share this video, share the link on your YouTube channel. If you have one and you may just have just a simple page, share it on it, uh, share it on your Facebook page. If you have a Facebook group, share it on your Facebook group, share it on your Instagram. You know, uh, that's how we really break this uh, this algorithm thing that's going on with the YouTube thing. So but with that being said, family, we are going to go ahead and get right into it. So we again, we have a lot to cover. All right. The second exodus. So I want to start off with asking this question. What is the second exodus? Let me say this, say this again. What is the second exodus? I'm going to ask it one more time. What is the second exodus? All right. Now, before I uh, continue, moderators, you guys know what to do. If there's anyone acting crazy inside the chat, you know what to do. Uh, give them a warning. Uh, if they continue to be disruptive, kick them out. And also for those that may not be aware, this channel is not monetized. But if you want to contribute to the channel, I pinned in the chat the Cash App. If you want to uh, share, uh, um, contribute to the um, to this platform. And what will happen is as I progress, I will check the Cash App. And if I see any Cash Apps, I will give you a shout out. Whatever messages you have attached to it, I will read it out, um, read it aloud. So. Uh, again, really appreciate all the love and support. So let's go ahead and get into a family. What is the second exodus? What is the second exodus? Now, on the bottom of your screen, at the bottom of your screen, what I'm highlighting with my arrow, this is ancient Hebrew, right? This is Shanai, right? Some would say Shanai, yeah. I'm just strictly pronouncing this from an ancient Hebraic perspective uh, or, or, uh, you know, pronunciation of the word. I'm not dealing with the Israeli language, what many mistakenly call modern Hebrew, mistakenly call or associated with uh, biblical Hebrew, supposedly. But anyway, this is Shanai, right? Which second, right? Then we see Sham Wath, right? And I'm going to explain this here because again, names have meaning. I'm going to say this one more time. Names have meaning. And based off of this topic, or should I say this title, this phrase or whatever, you know, this label, so many have misinterpreted scripture. You know, we just witnessed this all. Uh, many of us witnessed this with the 400 year prophecy. You know, many was uh, within our community was expecting uh, to see the prophecy uh, parallel the uh, prophecy of Exodus, what happened, or not Exodus, but um, the Egyptian prophecy in the book of Exodus. Many was uh, looking to see the fulfillment of the 400-year prophecy to mirror that, uh, that, that experience, that event for the Israelites, right? I mean, literally, there were... Uh, Many within this community thought that the waters were going to open up and that we were going to 
march right back to and take our rightful place uh, in our native country. Right. And that didn't happen according to how people thought it would happen. And one thing I've always said, I believe in the 400 year prophecy, but not according to what many teach. And there's plenty of recordings out there. I even taught on the 400 year prophecy for years. And that's always what I've uh, I, I, I would state as a disclaimer. Why? Because understanding what I'm going to share with you tonight. So what is the second exodus, right? And I'm just using these Hebrew words here, Shanai, Sham, Wath, all right? So what does this mean? What is it? Let's start with understanding the meaning of the word exodus, okay? Let's start with this. What is the original name of this book? Uh, the original name of this book, right, from a Hebraic school of thought Right. It transliterates to the word names. That's right, family. The ancient Hebrew word or the Israeli word that is being used is trans. It translates to the word, the plural word names. OK, let me give you the proof here. Right. Exodus chapter one, verse one. So it says this. Now, these are the names. Sham Wath of the children, Banya of Israel, Yashara Al. Now, the rule of thumb when you study the scrolls and the names, the titles of these different uh, uh, writings, these different books, right? You will see the name of the book within the first paragraph. Within the first paragraph or two, you'll see the name. Generally, the rule of thumb is the first sentence. Right. So we see here the names Sham Wath of the children of Israel, Ban Yah, Yashara Al. That is the name of Israel. Right. I mean, the name of this book. Exodus is not the name. And actually, Sham Wath does not mean Exodus. Let me show you. Here's the Hebrew dictionary definition of the word name. Right. As you see here, it says a mark or memorial of individuality. In other words, a literal name. Then you see here, honor, authority, character, fame, and fame, us, renown, report. And in the bottom of this text here, the bottom of this slide, you see reputation, fame, glory, right? Uh, glory, kabad, right? Can be used synonymously with this word, this Hebrew word. So, it can be a literal name or describing the reputation or the character, the authority, uh, the, the, the fame, the glory of the person who's actually the bearer of that name. OK, so when we say. The name in the name of Yahweh, we're with the authority, the character of the father, when we say in the name of Yahweh Shai. We're seeing the authority, the character, right? So when you see Sham, Wath, Wath is the feminine plural. So names, right? Uh, the singular is name, Sham. Plural is Sham, Wath. In the Israeli, is Shemot, right? So, uh, so we see here, this word shame, uh, Sham is simply, it means uh, a literal name. It could be literal, a literal name or the uh, honor, character, the authority, the reputation of the one bearing the name. So, again, the original name of this book is names, the names, Sham Wath of the children, Ban Yah of Israel. So when you're reading this particular book, it's all about Israel. There's no way anyone can try to insert the uh, fourth century construct church to this text. All right. So the original name of this book is names, Sham Wath of the children of Israel, Banya, Yashara Al. Okay. So what is the meaning of Exodus? All right. So we're going to, we're going to walk this thing out, family. We're going to give proper clarity here. So what is the meaning of the word Exodus, 
Well, I'm glad you guys asked. Let's start with the etymology dictionary definition of this word exodus. OK, and this is what it says. Right. It tells us old English and it tells us it comes from the Latin exit exodus. Then we see exodos for Greek. And actually it's two combinations of two words. All right. So it says a military expedition, a solemn procession, depart, departure, death, a going out. Right. X, right. Out. That's where you get the X portion. Right. Then you have hudos. Right. Uh, it says a way, path, road, a ride, journey, march. OK. So it says way out means. It goes on to say departure from a place. The migration of large bodies of people or animals from one country or region to another. We see here the Proto-Indo-European or a uh, word of this, uh, as you see here, Greek from the Proto-Indo-European word, uh, sod, right, which or, or sod, which is coarse, right? And then it says it connects to the Slavic words for coarse, coarse pro progress, okay? So... To read from a Sanskrit perspective, to tread on, excuse me, go on, to go away, become weak, right? Then we see the Proto-Indo-European root, said or sit, all right? So let's see what this word is, right? Because I want to start uh, I'll start with this word here, right? Uh, this is coming from the Ernest Klein Etymological Dictionary Definition of the word depart. Let's see what it means, depart, and we'll put it in the proper context of scripture depart let's see what it says here right and we see sa'a right and it says this here uh he quick he went quickly ran all right he went quickly ran so when we look at exodus right go into this book shamwath right shamwath we're going to go to chapter 12 uh verse 37 and let's go to this particular passage and let's see what the word is here. Right. It says here and the children of Israel journeyed Sa'a from Ramses to Sukkoth, about six hundred thousand on foot that were men beside children. So we see this word journey in this particular chapter. We see the word Sa'ath. So what does that mean? What am, where am I going at with this? So to give clarity, the ch children of Israel journeyed. And this is why you see the ancient word Sa'a here, right? So what is the second exodus? What is the second exodus? Again, words have meaning. And again, this is why um, our approach to the scriptures can be very uh, bad based upon uh, labels that have been created. Right. When we look at second Exodus, right again, many of our brothers and sisters, right under this label, they actually thought that uh, the waters were going to open up and we were going to march our way back to our home, uh, our native land. And, and, and I remember I had to encourage a few people. You know, had made posts on Facebook and, you know, had apologized, said, hey, they, they, they were disappointed. They thought that, uh, you know, this was going to happen. And I had to encourage them and um, not going to mention their names, but I had to encourage them and uh, explain to them briefly that, hey, you know, uh, the 400 prophecy is not false. There's no issue with it that the most high what the most high made through to Abraham about Israel. But it's. Uh, not what they con um, connected it to, thinking that it was going to be a mirror of uh, Exodus chapter 12. All right. That's what they were thinking. It was going to be exactly like Exodus chapter 12. They was expecting the same thing that Israel went through during this whole process of coming out of Egypt. They were expecting things to be the exact same way. OK, so. What is again? What is the second exodus? All right. The title second exodus is not a biblical term. Right. That, that's not a biblical term. 
You know, the title second Exodus is not a biblical term. Right. I, I, I like to go off what the scripture says. It's not a biblical term. I understand it. Right. I, I understand why it's being used. Right. But again, it's not, it, you know, uh, it's not a biblical term. I understand the source of where it comes from, and I'll share that with you. But we have to put things in its proper perspective because we want to make sure that uh, no one, uh, especially as teachers, that we don't indirectly mislead the people. All right. So what is a better name? Right. What is a better name? What is the order? Right. And, and, and we're going to answer this. We're going to answer this here as we progress. And again, this is going to be a two part lesson because, again, it's a lot to unpack here and it takes time to put these presentations together. Believe it or not, it took me uh, days to really format this presentation and I'm still putting it together. Right. Because it's, it's very detailed. As you can see the graphics here. All right. So I was trying to get as much as I could inside this particular presentation to format in a way to make it uh, presentable to you guys. So I still have to finish up uh, the, the other half to this. All right. So let's start with understanding too. What, what are the order? What, what is the order of the multiple captivities? Because we have to understand Israel went through a number of captivities. Let me say that again. Israel went through a number of captivities, right? Unfortunately, so many, many of them, most don't even talk about. They're right in the book of uh, uh, of Judges. You will see, again, Israel sin before Yah. You'll see that that is the theme. In Israel, each time they sent, they went into a captivity. That is a fact. I want to say special shout outs to my cousin, uh, Boom Bishop uh, Brown, holding things down and. Uh, in Georgia, uh, Florida, Ohio, as you see some of the uh, locations of the, the assemblies that are connected to uh, his ministry. So I want to say shout outs to my cousin here. All right. I want to say peace and blessings to you, cousin. I see uh, you say head on the screen, clicking the mouse. <laughs> then I um, also want to say peace and blessings to uh, Jay High Style, Sister Carol, and some of you other guys that are here all the moderators. And like I said, when I post some questions, I'll go through giving the shout outs because it can take some time going through shout outs here because of the amount of people that we have in the chat. So we have um, 300, over 300 people in the chat right now. Let's get those likes up. Uh, let's make sure that we have at least minimal right now. We should have at least a minimum of 100 likes inside the uh for this this video we should have at least 100 likes by right now it doesn't cost you anything family to hit that like button doesn't cost you anything to uh subscribe to the channel so uh click that that like button right now let's get that up to at least 100 let me see where we are right now all right all right oh man you guys yeah you guys beyond 100 my apology apologies let's get it to 200 all right let's get that those numbers to 200 all right. So let's continue, family. Let's get those numbers up. All right. And I want to um, plug my cousin's uh, channel as well. Uh, he has a YouTube channel and moderators. Uh, if you want or, or, or um, uh, uh, Bishop Brown, I encourage you. If you want, just uh, put it in the, um, in the comments section. And I believe you should be a moderator to do that anyway. I give you administrative uh, uh, privileges. So let me make sure to all right, let me make sure. Uh, in, in that way, you can also put your information here. All right. Let me change this. I want to let me change your privileges. I'm going to take you out as moderator and I'm going to make sure you have the administrative moderation here. All right. All right. There you go. I gave you the administrator one. All right. So uh, you have more of an uh, advanced uh, account here. All right. So that's his YouTube channel. All right. Uh, subscribe to his channel as well. And we have uh, we have um, we woke now extended. That's where I do all our Shabbat lessons there. So I encourage you guys to hit the like and subscribe to the channel. Shout outs to Yah's son. Peace and blessings. Been holding it down in the um, inside the 
the uh, comment section, as well as Jay Highstyle and some of the other moderators. Really appreciate you guys. So let's get those let's get those up to 300 likes. All right. Let's break the algorithm. All right. So what is the order of the multiple captivities? Right. Uh, in this order, I'm going to share with you here. Right. I'm not going to go through the judges kept the, the, the captivities listed in the book of judges, but I'm just going to start with the captivities that's listed in the book of Zechariah when you study Zechariah. But there was far more captivities than what's listed. So what is the order of the multiple captivities? What is the order? What captivity did the key prophets experience? See, that's important, too. When we start dealing with prophecy, especially from the prophet's perspective, we also have to understand the captivities that they were in. We have to understand the captivities that they were in. We cannot, we cannot piecemeal this thing together. We have to make sure that when we teach in prophecy, understand the setting when we start expounding on their prophecies that they have, have given. All right. So what captivity did the key prophets experience? I'm glad you asked. Let's start with some of them. Let's highlight a few of them. Let's start with Zechariah chapter one, verse 18. Zechariah chapter one, verse 18. Let's see what it says here. It says, then lifted I up mine eyes and saw and behold, four Arabi horns, Quran. All right. Now, I'm not going to explain the Quran. You guys already know. Go back and look at some of the lessons that I did on Revelation and I explained the horn, Quran. You guys already should know what that sound like, Quran or Quran. All right. So uh, that gives you some understanding about these horns. So horns, Quran, represent nations. It represents their leaders. It, it can also represent the strength of nations. So the horns, Quran or Quran, either way, how you want to pronounce it, were said to be specifically represented uh, uh, represent the nations that had scattered Israel. Let me say that again. The horns, right, in this prophecy, right, were said to specifically represent the nations that had scattered Israel. So when we go to verse 19 and verse 20, notice what it says. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? And he answered me, these are the horns, Quran, which have scattered Zara, Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So understand for some of you guys that may be new uh, into this awakening, and some of you guys that may be in the Christian, uh, still in the Christian church, right? Still in Christianity, still connected to Catholicism. And you may not know this because most don't know this. When you see the word Judah, that is representing the southern kingdom. When you see Israel, that's representing the Northern Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom went by a number of names. They were referred to as outcasts. They were referred to as other nations. They were referred to as Ephraim, right? And as you see here, Israel, right? So Judah, Israel, right? Judah, the north on um, the Southern Kingdom, Israel, the Northern Kingdom, right? And then you have Jerusalem. This is the headquarters. This is the capital. This is where the temple reside. Uh, was. The royalty, the king, that this is right. A tenth of each one of the tribes dwelt in this place. All right. So, and Yahweh shewed me four carpenters. Okay. So, again, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And Yahweh showed me four carpenters. Okay. So, the carpenters represents other nations chosen by Yah to be a tool of his judgment, right? Uh, I, I believe someone had made a post in one of my comments, uh, in, in the comment section of one of my posts, right? And stated that dealing with Russia, say, hey, Russia is a tool. So I had to respond to them. Okay, you can't just be selective, right? The most high used nations, other nations to bring correction to Israel. So you can't just say Russia, the United States, Great Britain, all these nations, the most high used to bring judgment on Israel. But guess what? There's a judgment coming toward to them because they went overboard with uh, 
t- uh, uh, carrying out Yah's instructions. That's a whole nother discussion. But anyway, the carpenters represent other nations chosen by Yah to be his to be his tool, right? To be his tool, right? A tool of judgment, right? And when you see carpenters, karash yam, right? That is the Hebrew word for uh, carpenters. That's the plural. Karash yam quaran, right? So these are the carpenters, right? Quaran, the horns, okay? These particular nations would destroy those who mistreated Israel. So the Most High will use these nations to destroy other nations that mistreated uh, Israel, but then bring judgment to them in succession. All right. So here's an example of this, right? The Assyrians, right? The Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. Let me say that again. The Assyria, right? The Assyrians, they conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. Right. So when you understand this, those are certain prophets that lived during this time, starting with what you see on your screen. This is Isaiah. Right. This is Isaiah. Now, of course, this is not a literal picture of Isaiah. But, you know, I like to uh, put images up here just to kind of make sure you guys understand this is our people we're referring to. This is our ancestors that we are referring to. So Isaiah was a prophet in Judah. Over a period of 40 years, his ministry paralleled the rule of four kings, King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and King Hezekiah. All right. So Isaiah is mentioned in the renewed covenant. This is why I refer uh, refer to what many would call the New Testament. I refer to it as a renewed covenant, and I'm not going to get into that tonight. So Isaiah is mentioned in the renewed covenant. 22 times, right? And to give clarity on exactly how uh, the Messiah, Israel during that time, the disciples, how they uh, interpreted the prophecies at that time by the writings of uh, the good news, right? The writings of Paul's letters, the writings of the other disciples' letters, and including the book of Revelation, right? This will give you proper clarity on how they view the prophets the, or the prophecies that are in what is what we call the law and the prophets and also the books of poetry, starting with Psalms. So Isaiah is mentioned in the renewed covenant 22 times. And we're not going to go through it tonight. Part two, we'll get more into uh, the, the renewed covenant confirming uh, key prophecies. All right. So the historical setting of chapters one through thirty nine presupposes a uh, a world in which Assyria was the dominant foreign power. The historical setting of chapters 40 through 60, uh, 40 through 66 uh, presupposes that uh, Babylonia had taken a serious place. Right. This is what is being taught. Many would teach that when you get to chapter 40 that uh, of Isaiah's writings. Now we're getting into the Babylonians. Uh, a takeover of the Assyrians. But I'm going to show you here uh, in a, a key passage to show that that's not so. So Judah's, Judah's cities, in this passage that I'm going to highlight, I'm not going to go into the details, highlights that Judah's cities were still in existence in this particular chapter, supporting the view that this portion of Isaiah was written prior to Neb- Nebuchadnezzar's invasion, which began in 60. Uh, of 605 BC. All right. And this is Isaiah chapter 43, verse six. All right. And this is what it says. I didn't put it, the entire passage here, but notice what it says. It says, I will say to the north, give up and to the south, keep not back. Now, this is dealing with the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. All right. Some would teach that this uh, uh, that uh, Isaiah is teaching primarily about the Babylonian captivity. They're teaching that this is primarily taught or or, or he's covering the Babylonian uh, captivity. But uh, this passage right here gives you clarity that the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were still in existence, right? They were not destroyed. So I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, keep not back. 
bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Right. So then we, we just covered the, um, the Assyrian, right, captivity. But then the Babylonians then conquered Assyria. All right. So this is where we get into Jeremiah. This is where we get into Jeremiah. Right. Jeremiah. And this is where you understand Daniel. Right. To interpret Jeremiah's sermons, his words, his his messages, one must know of the major movements and trends in the political and economic world of that day. That's why I say that when I hear people teaching about the prophecies, teaching about the book of Jeremiah, I can tell that they really don't fully understand the book of Jeremiah. There's more to the book of Jeremiah. And I can say with confidence that Jeremiah is not structured in a chronological order. It's not in a chronological order, excuse me for butchering the, the word. I got a little tongue twisted. It's not in that. It's not in a, a, a set order. And I'm going to explain to you why. So Judah, right, uh, five uh, uh, had uh, during this, this the time of Jeremiah, right, during these writings, right, Judah, right, had five different kings that sat on the throne during Jeremiah's 40 plus years of ministry. Right. So the book of Jeremiah, again, lack of chronological arrangement. It is a jigsaw puzzle, right? Because again, you could read one area, for example, uh, and I taught out of it today, Jeremiah chapter seven deals with the queen of heaven. And then you uh, see the continuation of that in Jeremiah chapter 44, the queen of heaven. So that's just giving you an idea. And when you make an attempt to try to read it as if it's in chronological order, it's going to confuse you. So this is why you have to really take your time and study the book of uh, Jeremiah. And you have to make sure that when you're studying that you're going to the proper uh, passages to make sure that you're getting clarity of what you're reading and what you're teaching. All right. So the book of Jeremiah contains prophetic discourses, um, biographical material, historical narratives arranged without apparent chronological sequence. So the 52 chapters cover a period of more than 40 years. And we're going to go into some details of Jeremiah tonight, but we're really going to go into some key prophecies in part two of this lesson. So the 52 chapters covers a period of more than 40 years. Now, guess what, family? Guess what? I'm here to tell you that the oldest manuscript of Jeremiah is not the original. Let me say that again. The oldest manuscript of Jeremiah is not the original. And I can tell you in with, with you know, uh, with, with, how can I put it? I can tell you with confidence that 95 percent, close to 99 percent of those that are teaching prophecy don't know this. So if you suddenly hear them start mentioning these, this here, this will give you a breadcrumb that they were listening to the presentation, which I'm not mad at, you know, because I, I want to make sure that this presentation gives us a, a baseline and show us how it's imperative for us as leaders to properly, uh, 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 how can I put it, address, or should I say approach, that's a better word to use, approach the text. So the oldest manuscript of Jeremiah is not the original. Let me say that again. The oldest manuscript of Jeremiah is not the original. Now, I encourage you guys to go to Jeremiah chapter 36, right? Make a note of these passages, family, because there's some key notes here. Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 27 through uh, and 28. Notice what it says here. Then the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah. After that, the king had burned the roll and the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah. So Baruch was the scroll. He was the, he's the scribe. He is someone that is uh, astute in the law. See, when you see these writings, most of these uh, prophets had a scroll, 
I mean, or should I say a scribe rather, writing it for them. Now, family, don't take this in a negative way saying, oh, well, who, who wrote the book of Jeremiah? Jeremiah authored the book of Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah, this writings here based upon uh, the instructions of the most high. All right. So then the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah. After that, the king had burned the roll. So the king had burned the roll and the words of Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah saying, here's verse 28, take thee again another roll and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned. So you see here, we have proof that Jeremiah had to write this over the original writing. And can you imagine, put yourself in his shoes, right? Because these scrolls are not like today, typing up an email, you know, uh, typing in the, you know, a chat and a message on your phones, you know, having a, having a keypad. No, writing in these roles, they were very time consuming. It could take you years to write a role. That's why when you see the earlier roles, the earlier manuscripts, they're filled with errors in terms of writings. Why? Because these were being manually written before the printing press came into play. That's a whole nother story about the history. So take take the again another role and write in it all the former words that were in the first role, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. All right. So Jeremiah also answers questions such as what happened to the bones of the ancient Israelites? Now, how many times have you guys heard this before, especially coming from the unconscious community? That's right. I'm going to call it, use that label because sometimes some of the things, that the, the arguments that they use, you know, tells you that they have no clue about scriptures. Even many of our brothers and sisters that go on that platform or some of these platforms really don't know these things that I'm presenting to you. And shout outs to my cousin, um, Bishop Brown, because he's been teaching this for years. You know, uh, I, I've been encouraging him and we're going to try to get it up here, uh, get the uh, his lesson on here of what he taught on Kemet. Right. He did a, a, a great job of discussing some of the arguments with uh, with within uh, the conscious community, what they use to try to uh, downplay, discredit our Dabar HaQuadash, in other words, her holy word. But anyway, Jeremiah, Yaramayah also answers questions such as what happened to the bones of the ancient Israelites? Right. And I know you guys, I know you guys are probably uh, figuring out how to answer this question. Well, here it is. Jeremiah chapter eight, verse one and two. Notice what it says here. At that time, saith Yahweh, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, the bones of. Princes, the bones of his of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out their graves. Verse two, and they shall spread them before the sun and the moon. And all the host of heaven whom they have loved and whom they have served and afterward, oh, excuse me, and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped, they shall not be gathered nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. So what is this? What is this telling you? This is telling you that uh, the Babylonians dug up the graves of our ancestors. This is where you get into, uh, you know, if you want to understand whether or not you should cremate your loved ones. See, when you cremate your loved ones, guess what you're doing? You're blotting them out. So what the Babylonians did by, uh, you know, uprooting the ancient Israelites, what they were doing, they was allowing what, what they wanted is their uh, their bodies, their bones and all that, as you see here, they shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. In other words, fertilizer. What is fertilizer? Fertilizer is dung, right? You guys know how fertilizer smell. 
you guys know exactly how fertilizer sm fertilizer smell. And I know I'm stepping on some of you guys toes when you when when I deal with cremation. Cremation was not something that was promoted in scripture. And I know many of our brothers and sisters, and I want to just put a side note, family, do the proper uh, preparations for you for you in terms of making sure that your family don't have to bear the burden of trying to figure out how they're going to bury you. Get the proper insurance, put money away, put money aside, make sure you have proper insurance policies and so forth. So that way your family, and matter of fact, make sure you write out a will that you will be buried. Not because you know, you have some family members, uh, some, some people that have done the proper, gone through the proper process and family members being greedy, Decided that they want to take the quick way out and start and do the cremation thing. No, take the time out, family, and make sure that you have these things covered. So, again, when you call yourself cremating, that is equivalent to blotting out. And that's what the Babylonians wanted to do with the Israelites. They wanted to blot them out, blot out their existence, blot them out, completely wipe them away, not just wipe out the temple, wipe out Jerusalem, wipe out their dwelling places. They want to blot out the history of them. That is the spirit of the crafty council, when you, especially when you start understanding the Babylonians. We as a people have gone through this spirit, still going through it, because all these nations, and you know, we deal with 83rd Book of Psalms, deal with the crafty council, all these nations made it a point under the spirit of Babylon to do what? Try to blot us out, put us in remember now to make sure the remembrance of our history, our culture, our heritage is no more. All right. So that's what the, that's what this passage is covering. All right. So the next one. So we, we dealt with the Assyrians, right? The Assyrians, was, they were conquered by the Babylonians. But guess what? The Medes and the Persians, in turn, they conquered Babylon, still dealing with the horns, so the four horns, the Medes and Persians, in turn, conquered Babylon. Right. So this is Nehemiah right here. Right. In the book of Nehemiah, when you understand the writings of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was an Israelite. He was an Israelite leader who had attained status in the Persian courts as cupbearer to King Arx, Arx, um, uh, Ar 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 Arxis, excuse me, excuse me if I butcher the name. I like to say Xerxes. OK, Art Xerxes. Excuse me for butchering the name. For some reason, I always butcher that particular name, but I'm just going to shorten it up by saying Xerxes. All right. So written about, uh, you know, in his book, he wrote about events around 446 BC, right? Written to the return exiles, the citizens of Judah and Jerusalem, right? Now, again, many will say, hey, it was just a return of the Southern Kingdom. The key is Jerusalem, the remnant, Right. When you read the book of Jeremiah, right a after they re restored the temple, rebuilt the city, rebuilt the walls, they had to draw lots. Right. So each tribe had to commit to a tenth, a tithe, right, a tenth of each uh, of their people or each one within their tribe to occupy Jerusalem. So all 12 tribes represented the remnant. In Jerusalem, the Most High will not allow any one tribe to be blotted out. When you read Judges, at Israel made an attempt as a whole to blot out the Benjamites, right? But the Benjamites, right? They connected to Judah, right? They were trying to blot out the um, the, the the Benjamites, and the Most High gave them a stern correction on that. But anyway. So uh, Esther, right, covers events during the reign of Xerxes I, who ruled Persia from 486 to 465 B.C. Uh, also, many believe to be written a few decades after Xerxes reign around 400 B.C. All right. So Esther, 
Nehemiah, Esther, again, now we're dealing with the Persians. But now when we get to this portion here, Alexander the Great of Greece conquered the Medes and the Persians. OK, and I didn't go into the details of that. You know, I could bring up some prophets, but I just didn't want to get into all that. It was just I was going to go through the time in the Maccabees, but it was just too much uh, too time consuming putting that together. All right. So then we have Rome conquered the Greeks. Right. The Romans conquered the Greeks. And the question is, who conquered the Romans? I'm going to do is uh, continue on when I continue on with Revelation chapter 18. I'll go and give you clarity on that. But I just want to leave you with that question. So what is the so-called second exodus? Is it the law of return? Is the second exodus the law of return? Is it the law of return? Well, let's answer this question, because these are some terms that we need. We need to address here, family, because we have the second exodus, which uh, on the surface, that title led so many to thinking that uh, the prophecies of Israel being gathered is going to be parallel to what happened uh, to, to the uh, the uh, events in uh, chapter 12 when Israel was delivered, taken out of Egypt. But now we have to answer this question. Is it the law of return? Is it the law of return? Now, this is coming from the Jewish Agency for Israel. Let me say that again. This is coming from the Jewish Agency uh, for Israel. This is the law of return. And I was trying to uh, uh, get uh, upload a couple of uh, short clips. Let me see if I have it available. If I can, I'll upload it uh, while we're teaching this, just so that way you guys can get an idea of this agency. Let me see if I could pull it up here real quick. I can't do it all, but let me see if I could just do a simple clip just so that way you guys can understand this group here. Let me see here. Uh, I may not. Let me try it this way. All right. Let me try it this way. Let me plug this up. I'm going to try to uh, show a clip here. No, that ain't work. My um, docking station is not cooperating with me tonight. All right. While my uh, plug, while while I plug up my hard drive here, and we'll continue on. And once it register, there we go. Once it registers, and I'm able to upload the clip here we'll get into it matter of fact i'm going to show this quick clip while i bring up this particular lesson all right let me show a clip here family as i uh, locate this lesson here so i'm going to show a couple of quick clips real quick while i do this in the process bear with me one second finally wells comes face to face with the man he's been searching for a new portrait of the common ancestor of every man today. Adam. Without a skull, we can't know for sure what Adam looked like. But a combination of genetic evidence, vendors' forensic skills, and cutting-edge computer software suggest he looks something like this. Thousands of years after the Bible and hundreds of years after Michelangelo, we have a whole new face for Adam. I like the expression. He's got a very forceful look. You know, he's intent on something, maybe taking over the world. You, know, you begin to get perhaps an insight into why these guys won out and why this guy's our ancestor. Herodotus, 
450 BCE, who is considered the father of history, states that it is in fact manifest that the Cochidians are Egyptians by race. Several Egyptians told me that in their opinion, the Cochidians were descendants from the soldiers of Sesostris. I had conjectured as much myself from two pointers, firstly because they have black skin and kinky hair. Aristotle 320 BCE, the great philosopher and father of scientific thinking, speaks rather derogatorily about the Egyptians, but nonetheless shows that he too regarded them as black skin. Those who are too black are cowards, like for instance, the Egyptians and Ethiopians, but those who are excessively white are also cowards, as we can see from the example of women. The complexion of courage is between the two, in other words, brown or hand. Aeschylus 480 BCE in his play The Suppliants comment on an Egyptian ship. I can see the Egyptian crew with their black limbs and white tunics. Apollodorus 70 BCE affirms that Egyptos conquered the country of the black-footed ones and called it Egypt after himself. Greek writers Lucian 180 BCE presents a dialogue between two Greeks, Lincinus and Timolas, discussing a young Egyptian boy. Lincinus, this boy is not merely black, he has thick lips and his legs are too thin. His hair worn in a plate behind shows that he is not a free man. Now, the problem for me, it's not about color. It's not about white and black. This is a very reductive way to talk about things. This is the way that Americans talk about it. I'm very sorry. Like, I come from Egypt. Egypt has a very diverse color palette. People can look like me or they can look deeper skin tone like Anwar Sadat, who comes from a Nubian origin. It's not about black and white. It's not about black and white. It's not about black and white. It just doesn't matter. It just At the end, it doesn't matter the color of your skin. Shemai was Egyptian. At the end, it doesn't matter the color of your skin. Shemai was Egyptian. At the end, it doesn't matter the color of your skin. Shemai was Egyptian. It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. All right, family, I couldn't find it. I was trying to find it. Uh, didn't want to take too too much time trying to locate it. But what I'll do is I'll do a, a special video in that regards that will deal with how we get treated by this agency called the Jewish Agency for Israel. So I'll make sure that the next time we uh, do a live that part two, I'll show you the uh, I'll show you the videos on how the uh, Jewish agency for israel how they treat uh the uh the, the jews per se uh that are honoring the law of return versus how they treat and receive our people so we'll deal with that another time i thought i can locate it but uh, i have to do some research on that but anyway so this is coming from the jewish agency and this is what they say about the law of return right with the inception of the state of israel two thousand years of wandering were officially over. Since then, Jews have been entitled to simply show up and request to be Israeli citizens, assuming they pose no imminent danger to public public health, uh, state security, or the Jewish people as a whole. Essentially, all Jews everywhere are Israeli citizens by right. In 1955, the law was amended slightly to uh, specified that dangerous criminals could also be denied that right. That's a whole nother discussion. All right. 
1970, Israel took another historic step by granting automatic uh, uh, citizenship, not only to Jews, but also to their non-Jewish children, grandchildren, spouses, to the non-Jewish spouses of their children and grandchildren. This addition not only ensures that the families would not be broken apart, but also promised a safe haven. So you already see it. You guys can read through the lines and see the the, the deceptions, the delusions here. But I want to hone in on uh, this key quote here from what I read. All Jews everywhere are Israeli, right? What is an Israeli? What does this word mean? Let me show you real quick. An Israeli, citizen of the state of Israel. Let me make sure you understand that. When you hear the term Israeli, it means citizen of the state of Israel, right? That I, right? Israel plus Hebrew national designation suffix I also used in English as the adjective. But here's the kicker. It distinguishes the citizens of the modern state from the ancient people. So have you noticed that this is what the Jewish community, as we know them, they refer to themselves as Israeli. Because to be an Israeli, you simply are born in the territory, but you are not original to the territory. Most people don't get don't catch that. And many within the church are doing whatever they can to sweep this under the rug. Right. Many from the church. Right. This is where they start coming up with this. So whenever you see the word Israeli, it's that that designation that this word, this title is making it clear that they they are not the original people. They are not related to the original people. It simply means that they are citizens of the modern state. And those that may have been born in the territory, that they are not aboriginal to the territory. All right. So I want to make sure that you guys understand that key point. Right. So let's see how the law return defined the requirements of a Jew. Let's see what they say about the Jew, what it means to be a Jew. Right. This is coming from the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It says definition for the purpose of this law, Jew. And this is dealing with the law of return, which they re refer to as Aliyah. Jew means a person who was born of a Jewish mother or has become converted to Judaism and who is not a member of the uh, of another religion. All right. Let me read it one more time just so that way you guys understand what it says. It says for the purpose of this law. Right. Jew means a person who was born of a Jewish mother. Right. What? become converted to Judaism what? or here's the kicker, right? You see, they, they, you know, like they say, whoever writes the pages, whoever writes the pages control your thoughts. 
But it also says, and who is not a member of a another race. Life is like a hurricane here in Duckburg. Race has lasers, aeroplanes. It's a duck blur. See, that's how it's currently defined. And there's so many doing their ducktail dance because of this definition here. But it's it's a whole nother discussion. I want to get sidetracked, but I want to make sure you guys understand what the definition is of being a Jew. But I can say this. There's not a single passage. That even make the suggestion of being converted to being a blood descendant of Israel. I'll just leave it at that. I'll just leave it at that. There is not a single passage that gives the slightest thoughts or idea that you can convert over to being an Israelite by way of a religion. So what is the meaning of Aaliyah? What is the meaning of Aaliyah? See, family, this is how you uh, investigate. This is how you study. This is how you rightly divide. Right? We cannot sit back and just accept these terms, these different terms that is thrown, thrown before us. We've already been duped. Hasatan is not doing anything, or should I say, he's not leaving any stone uncovered. But let's see what Aaliyah means. Let's go to the Hebrew dictionary definition of this word Aaliyah, right? Notice what we see here. It says something lofty, a stairway, a second story room, chamber, upper chamber. Because you see the word is called law of return. So when you think about Aaliyah, you're going to think about the word return being associated with this. So let's go to the primitive root word of this word, where the word Aaliyah come from, which is Allah. It means to ascend. In other words, be high or actively mount. It means to arise or cause to rise, ascend up at once. Right. Burn, cause to burn. Interesting, right? Burn, cause to burn. Carry up, cast up, depart, exalt, excel, fetch up, get up, go, make to go, make to go away, raise, recover, restore. So is this the Hebrew word the Jews used to establish the law of return called Aaliyah? Right? That's a question. So the Jews connect the law of return to the word Ole. This word is also connected to the word, uh, the Hebrew word for burnt offering. Let me show you here. Right. In the ancient Hebrew is Allah. Right. Allah or Awala. But notice what you see here. You see Ola. Which is also pronounced Ole. They use this word to transliterate to the word Holocaust. Notice what you see here. A step, stairs, ascending. Notice here, burnt offering, sacrifice. But notice this key word right here. Let's zoom into it. Let's zoom into it. You see the word Holocaust. Wait a minute. When did the burnt offering mean Holocaust? Oh, you see the political stamps all over this definition. You see the political stamps all over this definition. When did this word mean Holocaust? And you know, when you're dealing with the Holocaust, 
That is what burning, sacrificing people. Now you're getting into what? Human sacrifice. When did this word be associated with human sacrifice? All right. So what scripture? What scripture do they use to support the law of return? Well, let's answer this question. We're going to go to the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. And let's see what they say. See, family, we have a lot to unpack. That's why I say it's going to take at least two lessons to really slow walk this thing. So that way we can put things in this proper perspective and then we can also expose the agendas connected to many of these titles, these labels. So let's see what it says here. And I'm going to drop this link inside the comment section. Right. This is one of those links you guys should go to just so that way you get clarity. These are some of the sources that you should have, you know, just to kind of uh, get clarity on exactly what's being read. So I'm going to put the law of return here real quick for us. I'm going to put the Jewish agency up here real quick, just so that way you can have it for your record. Let me drop this link here real quick. All right. Let's drop this inside the chat. All right. So this is the link to the Jewish agency that I made reference to earlier. All right. That's the Jewish agency. All right. So let's give you this current link. All right. Let's go to this Christian, Jewish Christian website. All right. Let's go here. All right, let's see here. Let's copy this inside the chat. All right, there you have it for you to go back over and review. Okay, so let's see what they say about uh, Aaliyah. Let's see what they explain, what they say about Aaliyah. It says Aaliyah, a banner to the nations, right? And when you understand that word banner, you'll get the word, the ancient Hebrew word, Awath or Ath, right? Or Athah, right? Uh, which means a sign, proof, evidence. It also transliterates to banner, but it's still a banner simply as a sign. So this is supposed to be a sign to the nations, right? Aliyah, a banner, a sign, a proof, evidence to the nations. A special term from the Hebrew Bible is used to describe the process of returning to the land, aliyah, which means to ascend. It was used in ancient times in reference to Jewish pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem for the three great biblical feasts, Passover, right? The, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of the Pentecost, and tabernacles. Thus, the process of making aliyah today is seen as having spiritual meaning beyond the physical act of return. Let's see what the Bible says to the modern day return of the Jewish people to their ancient homeland, the land of Israel. Right? Under the section, under the same, the same source here, it says there are two returns. Isaiah 11 and 11 indicates there would be a day when God would raise his hand a second time to gather the children of Israel to their homeland. The first return was predicted by the prophet Jeremiah to take place after Israel had been in captivity for 70 years. Right. And they make reference to Jeremiah 29, verse 10, according to Ezra, chapter one, verse one. And I'm going to explain this in part two. Right. Because I want to take the time and explain this. Right. Because when you understand uh, these prophecies, number one, Israel, when the most high gave them, uh, uh, gave them the declaration to return home. Many of them chose not to return. Many of them, many of them chose to stay in the places where they were initially oppressed, where they were kidnapped, where they were raptured to. Only a, a handful decided to return. So the question is, why is there a second time? 
So we're going to really explain this, family, because, again, many of you guys don't know this on the surface because it's not being taught. That's why we're having this discussion. To iron out, sift out what's lies, uh, or should I say that's not true? I'd rather just say that because some just, you know, just really don't know. Many just really don't know. So I'll just say uh, non-truths. All right. I don't want to just say lies. I'll just say non-truths when it comes to our many within our community. Right. But you do have others that just are spreading lies. You know, groups and uh, agencies are spreading lies. All right. So notice what it says here. Right. According to Ezra one and one happened precisely as foretold. After 500 years of intermittent and partial sovereignty in the land, the Jewish people were once again dispersed under the Roman Empire in AD 70. After 2000 years, they have now returned and reestablished sovereignty. So, again, we're going to touch on really go into the book of Jeremiah. We're going to touch on it some tonight, but we're really going to go in on the book of Jeremiah next week in part two. Uh, and tie Isaiah, Ezekiel, because I didn't mention Ezekiel tonight. I'm going to tie some of these things in with what the Messiah, his disciples, uh, what we see in Revelation. We're going to get proper clarity. OK, so after 2000 years, they have now returned and re reestablished sovereignty. No other people group has managed to survive two exiles, much less one that was 2000 years long and then returned to reestablish national sovereignty. The second return is for all nations. This second return was to be from every nation where they had been dispersed. And notice the passages here. We're going to go through these passages in part two. We're going to touch on some of it tonight, but we're really going to go and get proper clarity of these passages. Not just Babylon over the past 120 years or so, more than 3.5 million Jews have immigrated to the land of Israel from all over the world, from the north, south, east, west, and literal fulfillment of God's promise. And we see Isaiah 43, verse 5 through 6 highlighted. I just proved that this right here, <laughs> Isaiah 43, is still what this was written under the Assyrian captivity. It wasn't written under the Babylonian captivity. So just that right there should bring a red flag. So we're going to give proper clarity on this family. I know it's a lot of information, but this is Isaiah chapter 11. Verse 11 and 12, right? It says, and it shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh shall set his hand again the second time to recover Kwana, uh, Kwana Wath, right? Plural, right? Because the second time, right? To recover, right? To recover the remnant, right? Now, and, and I didn't have a chance to put some of the key, additional key Hebrew words into there. Right. I, I, I should pull it up uh, just so that way you can actually get each one of these Hebrew words uh, to, to make sure that it says what it says. You know, matter of fact, let me pull it up real quick before I go on. I'm just, you know, normally I try to uh, pull certain keywords in. But let me go to it real quick. Let me see what it says in there. All right. And I may may touch on it real quick. So let's see here. Isaiah 11 and 11. Let me see, let me pull it up here. Let's see what's here. 11, 11. All right. And let's see here. All right. Let's see if I, what I'm looking for in Isaiah 11 and 11. And I will expound on this. If not tonight, I will get into it in part two. Uh, let's see, uh, 11, 11. All right. Let's see if I see this in this word that I'm looking for. All right. All right. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll touch on that in part two. Yeah, I was going to get into it. I'm, I'm going to wait till part two. 
All right. Just so that way we could get through this lesson. All right. But it says here, right, the remnant, right, to recover the second, again, the second time to recover, Kwanawath, the remnant, Sha'ar, of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set an ensign, a sign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcast of Israel, that's the northern kingdom, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. All right. So this is what we really need to go into, family, because I can tell you with clarity. Right. And we'll do a touch on it on part two when we deal with Jeremiah, that when Israel was supposed to return to uh, their hometown. They they handful returned. Many of them decided to flee to Egypt. That's a whole nother discussion. That is so, let's see here. Let me see. It looks like I see someone here. All right. I see someone say here, white collar chick. Let me see what this person says here. All right. I'm trying to see what white collar chick is. All right. White collar chick made a comment saying, are we leaving or are we not leaving? Uh, sis, this is not about trying to say that we're not leaving. This is nowhere. This this is not challenging whether or not we're leaving or what we're, we're not leaving. I'm not sure if you came in at the beginning of the lesson. If you haven't, go to the beginning of the lesson. This is not challenging whether or not uh, if there is a gathering of our people. That's not what this is about. This is giving clarity to the terms second exodus, even what we just read, the law of return. All right. So this is not about whether or not uh, the most high is going to gather us again. I just gave the answer whether or not he's going to gather us again. But to explain what's true and what's not true in terms of a lot of the stuff that is being taught. So this is not about whether or not we are leaving or not. This is about what is true and what's not true. We know that ultimately the most high is going to gather his people. All right. So I just want to give you clarity on that. You know, so I'm not sure what you're confused about. Right. So, uh, again, I'm not saying anything about notice what I said. I didn't touch on gathering yet. And we'll get there in a second. Right. We'll get there in a second to give you a Hebrew word. Right. And I think I already I already gave one. Right. Like quite early on journey when I explained. So that's why I'm not I, I'm not even going to go back into it. Go back to the beginning of the lesson. And I actually gave you the Hebrew word for journey. Right. But we're also going to use the term. Uh, give you clarity on the word gather. Right. So. I, as I pointed out, we sh I don't agree with us using the word second exodus because it's going to automatically have you line up, sync up with what happened in Exodus chapter 12, thinking that everything is going to happen identical to what happened to the events with us coming out of Egypt. All right. So go back over to the beginning of the lesson and I give clarity on that. So I don't want to I don't want to double um, double back on something that I already covered uh, for those that are coming in late. But anyway, so again, we see here, Yahweh shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. And these are some of the these are the locations it says which shall be left from Assyria, Egypt, Pathro, Cush, Elam, Shinar and from Hamath and from the island of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign, in other words, signs for the nations and shall assemble the outcast of Israel, gather together, disperse of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So Yahweh shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left. So what is remnant? 
What is the remnant? Sha'ar. What does remnant mean? Right? It means a remainder, residual, a portion, surviving portion. Right? Think of that term, surviving portion. Right? Survi residual, surviving portion. When you say that you are the remnant, you are saying that you are the surviving portion. All right. But let's go to the primitive root word, Sha'ar. Let's go to the primitive root word of Sha'ar. Let's see what it means of the remnant. It says here to swell up an example, be redundant. Here's the kicker. Be left. Let remain remnant. But notice what this says at here. I'm going to blow it up here. What does it say? Be left behind. Let me say that again. It says be left behind. So the remnant is those that are left behind. Let me say that again. The remnant are those that are left behind. See, the rapture doctrine teaches the opposite. The rapture doctrine will make you believe that there's a problem with being the remnant. We are the remnant. I'm not going to get into the full uh, explanation of that, but we are the remnant. We are the remnant of our ancestors that uh, the hundred plus million that was kidnapped, murdered and all that, you know, rapture. That's what the word rapture means. We are the descendants of them. We are the remnant. But even within Israel, right, there's a remnant within Israel because not all of Israel is going to make it right. We know that there's rebels among the Israelites that are what? Not going to make it. So left behind, we are the remnant, the remnant, the surviving portion. So the remnant are the left behind. Real quick, what did the Messiah say about the remnant? The left behind. Let's see what he says real quick. Matthew chapter 20, verse 15 and 16. I know some of you guys may say, hey, wait a minute. He said something about the remnant. Yes, he did. Verse 15 of chapter 20. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will? I will with mine own. Is thine I evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first shall be last for many are called, few are chosen. So the last Akar Yath or Akar Rayath shall be first Akad and the first Akad last Akar Yath or Akar Rayath for many be called, but few chosen. So let's look at the definition of the word last. Notice what it says. Akar right? Yath, it says here, or Ikar Rayath, right? I'm just pronouncing it in ancient Hebrew, right? So, and it is really, it'd be Akarith, all right? All right, uh, anyway. So, notice what it says here. The last or end remnant. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So, that's what the Messiah, that's what last means? The end or notice what it says here, the remnant residue. Oh, wait a minute. So the surviving portion, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. The remnant shall be what? First. Oh, my goodness. That should that should have you guys uh, tap dancing right now. Just off of that right there what the Messiah said about the remnant. Right. You know, and I know we are being treated like the last. We are being treated like we're so insignificant. But guess what? Y'all should be doing this right now. All right. Y'all should be doing that right now. Y'all should be doing that right now. The, mo the, the Messiah gave clarity on the remnant. All right. He gave clarity on the remnant. All right. Let me see. Let me do something real quick. I want to pull something up here. Just in case I want to check the cash apps. Just in case um, some of you guys may have contributed to the lesson. All right. Let me see here. All right, let's see here. All right, I want to give some shout outs just in case some of you guys may have uh, sent a contribution. 
All right. Let's see here. All right. Okay. All right. We're good. We're good. All right. Actually, I see one here. I want to say Kendra. Um, I want to say Miss Kendra. I want to thank thank you for your contribution. Uh, thank you for the 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 uh, the, the uh, I like to say seed. Uh, thank you for uh, you know this contribution here to the works that we're doing here. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. So, what is the second Exodus? What is the second Exodus? Right. This is one of the passages that are used uh, for uh, to justify the uh, what many used to justify the label second Exodus. Isaiah chapter 27, verse 12 and 13. Right. And it says here, and it shall come to pass that day that Yahweh shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt. And ye shall be gathered. Ye shall be what? Gathered. The key is gathered. La quat. Ye shall be gathered in one. Right? It says gathered one. Akkad. By one. Akkad. O ye children of Israel. I hope you'll grab hold of this here. Right? A more accurate description would be gathered regathered journey right but the hebrew word here is la quat la quat right and it shall come to pass in that day that yahweh shall beat off the channel of the river unto the stream of egypt and ye shall be gathered one by one o ye children of israel and it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, the choir, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt. Why? Because many of our brothers and sisters, even though the Most High delivered us from Egypt, they continued to live in Egypt. Many decided to go back to Egypt. And many of them had a hard time. That's why you see Egypt here. It says, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcast in the land of Egypt and shall worship Shathak Yahweh in the holy mount at Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that's the headquarters of what? Our, our territory, our homeland. And the pattern that you're going to see is that the most high everywhere you see gathering, the key is Jerusalem. Even in this, uh, the, 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 this uh, anticipation of the most high gathering up his people, right? Regathering his people, that great gathering that we all anticipating, right? The most high already have an attended location for us to be gathered at. And that is our native land. That's our native land. That is our native land. The Most High is not instructing us to just float with the wind. As you see here, and this is dealing with the Assyrians. This is dealing with the Egyptians. And he says that, and it says, and shall worship Yahweh in the holy mount at Jerusalem. So we see Jerusalem. That's the capital. That's the that's where the remnant dwells out of all 12 tribes. So you're going to see the reoccurring theme of the, the Most High having a specific place for Israel to go to. And you'll see this in Jeremiah when I get get there in uh, lesson number two. All right. So the Hebrew dictionary definition of gather. Notice what it says here. Laquat. It says to pick up, to gather, to glean. Right. Again, to pick up, gather up. Right. Laquat. Gather. Laquat. Gather. Did the prophet Isaiah forget to mention the Babylonians? Because this is what happens. Right. Uh, when you start, many start interpolating the text. They'll begin to lump everything all into one. 
Because remember, Isaiah, right? Isaiah lived during the uh the 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 Assyrian captivity. He lived during the Assyrian captivity. There's more I can unpack about the about Isaiah because uh many uh scholars will break this up into two. But that's a whole nother discussion. Right going into the latter portion of Isaiah. But notice you see here, la quad, to gather, to glean, pick up. Okay. Did the prophet Isaiah forget to mention the Babylonians? No. <laughs> the Babylonian captivity did not occur at this time of the prophecy. The Babylonian captivity did not occur at this time of the prophecy. This is why it's so dangerous by not going into the proper context of each one of the prophets and each captivity and make the proper connections. So I want to make sure you guys understand this. The Babylonian captivity did not occur at this time, at the time of this prophecy. At the time of this prophecy, Israel was under the authority of the Assyrians and made uh, it made entered. Right. Um, and actually, I don't like that. You know, excuse me for. The typo here. Right. Shouldn't be made here and entered agreements with the Egyptians. Israel was still making agreements and making connections with the Egyptians. So at the time of this prophecy, Israel was still under the authority of the Assyrians and they had their connection with the Egyptians. And when we go to Isaiah chapter 30, verse one through three, right, this is still tying into this whole period. Woe to the rebellious Rarawas children, saith Yahweh, that take counsel, but not after me. And that cover with a covering, but not my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Notice what Israel guilty of doing that walk to go down to Egypt, go down into Egypt and have not asked my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Wow. The most high called them a shadow. So Israel was still in captivity here. Right. They were in captivity, but they were also trying to cut deals with the Egyptians, hoping that the Egyptians will take them away from the Assyrians, get them out of this Assyrian captivity. So they tried to enter into an agreement here. Deuteronomy 28, 68. Therefore, shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust and the shadow of Egypt, your confusion. So Yahweh pronounced a woe, a strong warning of judgment on the rebellious people of Judah because they continue to refuse his help. Time and time again, they rejected Yahweh and their hearts became hardened. The rebellious Judah, right, formed an alliance with the Egyptians. Judah was facing, uh, you know, a great threat by the Assyrians, right? Because the Assyrians, they were. Uh, uh, you know, they were they were just taking over everything. They took over everything. So guess what? Uh, you know, because they had already taken over. Right. They had already taken over the northern kingdom. So the, the, the Assyrians were threatening the southern kingdom. So Judah was facing a great threat by the Assyrians. So the leaders believed that the nation's only hope was to form an alliance with Egypt. Let me say that again. The southern kingdom was already in. They were already conquered by Assyria, right? Samaria, right? When you think of Samaria, think of the northern kingdom. So the southern kingdom, which consisted of Judah and the Benjamites, and of course, later, later the uh, Levites, right, fled because Jeho uh, Jer Jeroboam, Decided that he was going to replace them. He got into all he, man. He was he was a mess. So he decided that he wanted to create his own priesthood. He even tried to create his own Jerusalem. If you study the scriptures. 
So the Levitical priests, the Levites, they fled to Jerusalem that was under the protection of uh, the southern kingdom. So Judah was facing a great threat by the Assyrians, right, who had already captured the northern kingdom. And the leaders believed that the nation's only hope was to form an alliance with Egypt. All right. So what is hope? Thakwawa, this is where you get the Israeli word tikva. It says here, accord, expectancy, expectation. So uh, when you look at this word, word hope, it's also a lifeline. So hope literally means a cord. Hope simply means a lifeline. This is the uh, di Oxford Dictionary definition of lifeline, a thing on which someone or something depends or which provides a means of escape from a difficult situation. Right. As you see here, a rope or line used for life saving, typically one thrown to rescue someone from uh, in difficulties in water or one used by sailors to secure themselves to a boat. So lifeline, the key to a lifeline is what's on the other side. What type of anchor do you have to secure you? So I want to encourage you guys, stand, rejoice, cheer up, be glad, have joy while holding on to your lifeline. Just thought I'd throw a little word of encouragement there. So when we go back to Isaiah chapter 31, verse 31, but we're going to highlight verse, uh, uh, we're going to read it again, right? Actually, we're going to go to 31. This The other verse was uh, verse of chapter 30, right? But notice what it says here. Woe to them that go to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in their chariots. What does this mean? Israel. Right. Not Israel, but Egypt, their special forces was their chariots, which was destroyed uh, when they tried to uh, come against Israel after they left Egypt. Look at our family. You'll see that's Exodus chapter 14. Fear ye not stand still. See the salvation of Yahweh. These Egyptians that you see here today, they will never have strength or power over you again. The most high shall fight for you, but you must hold your peace. So at that time, the Egyptians, right, their special forces, which were their horses and chariots. That's like the special forces in, in the military. The Benjamites had archers that was left handed. They was they was off the chain. They they gave the rest of the tribes. Uh, they, they gave him the business when you study judges. Right. Uh, that led to uh, the beginning of a divided kingdom. Right. But these are the special forces for the Egyptians. So now by this time in history, they regained their strength. They, be, they were able to rebuild their army, but they were still a shadow, as the scripture says. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help. And stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and horsemen because of the numbers getting caught up in the numbers. Doesn't that sound like Gideon? Right. But anyway, because they are very strong. Right. And the Hebrew word is ma'ad. Sounds interesting. Right. Ma'ad, the English mad. Right. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek Yahweh yet. He also wise and will bring evil and will not cause his words. I mean, that will excuse me and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of them that work iniquity. In other words, bending, twisting the law, statutes and commandments. Right. So he already made a judgment for Judah, all those that decided that they were going to go down and uh, uh, go to their, 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 their strongholds that they were delivered from and make agreements with them. Right. So Judah hope was not to be found in the military of Egypt, but rather in the power of Yah. They needed to repent. Judah was into Id idolatry. So Judah, instead of repenting, they decided to go back into want, want to go back into bondage. Right. So what was the backbone of the Egyptian army that Yah destroyed? I stated before their chariots and their horsemen. So Israel is seeking salvation from their Egyptians, uh, from the Egyptians because of their special forces. So Israel is seeking salvation by going back to Egypt, Judah, because, again, the northern kingdom was already taken. So when we go to Isaiah chapter 31, verse three, go back here. Right. Notice what it says here. Now, the Egyptians are men. Adam 
and not Allahayim. Your translation will say God, right? You hear the Egyptian, I mean, these Egypt or Kemetic guys saying uh, black man is God, the woman is God and all this other stuff, but pull this scripture out on them. Now the Egyptians are men and not Allahim. Yours is say God and their horse is flesh and not spirit. When Yahweh shall stretch out his hand, Yod, both he that helpeth shall fall and he that hopeth shall fall down and they all shall fail together. So now the Egyptians are not, they, they are men, they are not Yah. They are not deities. They are not the transliterated word, the proto indo Germanic, the Proto-Germanic word God, which comes from the word got. They're not deities. Israel had to be reminded not to worship and I and idolize the Egyptians again. Right now, what does this word now mean? It says at the present, immediately. Now that. So in that present time, immediately they needed to understand this. Even today in the now, we still need to understand this. The Egyptians are not deities. They are simple people. They are man. They have blood just like you and I, regardless of what uh, what may seem to be glittering on that side of the Jordan. So Judah had to be reminded of their past and their present and they're also there now and they're now. Judah had to be reminded that in the in the uh, this present time, immediately, the Egyptians are men and not Yah. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 21 and verse 20 uh, through 23. This is a reminder, and we'll touch on Ezekiel uh, on some additional passages, not in this lesson, but part two. Son of man, I have broken Sharab, excuse me, Shabar. I have broken Shabar, the arm, Zara I, oh, excuse me, Zara. I, right? Let me say that again. Shara Y or Shara Y or Shara I, however you want to pronounce it. Some would uh, connect this uh, Y to the Ra. That's why I'm saying it in both ways. A Pharaoh, Para I or Para, para I, I, king of Egypt, and lo, it shall be bound, Kabash, and be healed, uh, Ra Pa Wath, right? To put a roller to bind it, to make it strong, to hold the sword. Let me read it again. Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and lo, it shall not be bound up to be healed, to put a roller, in other words, trying to put it up in a splint, to bind it, to make it strong, to hold the sword. So the Most High is saying, guess what? Israel, the Egyptians have no power. That's part of his promise. In Exodus chapter six, verse six, he said the Egyptians have no power. He's going to break their strongholds over Israel. Only power that is, um, the Egyptians have is what Israel continued to give them. As you see here, that's what this is saying. Son of man, I have broken the arms of Pharaoh. I have broken the strings. I have broken the attachment. I have broken the uh, dependencies. I have broken the strongholds. I have broken the siege. And lo, it shall not be bound up to be healed. In other words, there's no healing. There's nothing that's going to do. I mean, that can happen to restore the arms of Pharaoh, to put a roller to bind it, to make it strong, to hold the sword. Verse 21. Therefore saith Yahweh Allah, behold, I am against Pharaoh, the king, um, king of Egypt, and will break Shabar, his arms, Zarawai, right? Uh, he says that even if you try to repair it, he's going to break it again. He will never have the power again. It said the strong and that which was broken, I will cause the sword to fall out of his hand. So even with their military being repaired, the most high said, I'm going to continue to break it. That military will never be strong. That military will never have the have the power. No matter what, they will not be restored to greatness in terms of their army, their military might. The influence over Israel, but Israel keep giving them the influence, the power, enabling them. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and will disperse them through the countries. So for 40 years, the Egyptians were dispersed. Read the scriptures. So Egypt, the nation's existence was not blotted out, but their control, their authority over Israel was forever removed. 
So Egypt reputation is connected to Israel because they held them bound. So Yah promised that his disciples of Israel would be limited. Right. Yahweh was this um, dis, um excuse me not disciples Yah promised his discipline of israel would be limited excuse me for saying disciples Yah promised that his discipline of israel would be limited yahweh's discipline did not destroy did not blot out and it did not replace his chosen people the israelites let me say that again Yah's discipline did not destroy did not blot out did not replace his chosen people the israelites sometimes yahweh punished israel by allowing them to suffer from war or even exile right so this leads me to isaiah i know i'm covering a lot here the prophet isaiah warned israel that if they did not repent Yahweh would use Assyria as his rod of mine anger. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 10, verse five and six, because this is the this is uh, the, the prophecies about the Assyrian army. And guys really study the book of Kings and Chronicles, especially second Kings. You'll see all of this confirmed there. All right. Oh, Assyrian, the rod Shabbat. Right. Notice the word Shabbat in ancient Hebrew. Right. Shabbat means rod. It means scepter. You can also transliterate to people, but Shabbat. So when you say Shabbat in ancient Hebrew, you're not referring to the uh, the day of rest. You're referring to the rod. Anyway, Assyria, oh, Assyrian, the rod, Shabbat of mine anger, op or apa in Israeli language, it'd be off and the staff, mata in their hand. Yad is my uh, indignation. Let me read it again. O Assyria, the rod of mine anger. So the Assyrians is a tool. And the staff in their hand is my indignation. Verse six, I will send him against the hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath. Will I give him a charge to take the spoil and take the prey and to um, tread them down like the mirror of the streets? So Yahweh used the Assyrians, used Assyria's extreme desire to dominate all nations as a means to carry out his judgment upon the northern kingdom of Israel. And because of Israel's rebellion uh, and betrayal, Yahweh was going to allow uh, the Assyrian, uh, the Assyrian um, community, allow Assyria to conquer the northern kingdom. And this is what leads me to Second Kings chapter 17, verse one through six. Like I pointed out, this is to confirm this. In the 12th year of Ahaz, king of Judah, began Hosea, the son of Elah, to reign in Samaria over Egypt over Israel nine years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, but not as the kings of Israel that were before him. And it says against him came up Shalaman, uh, Shalaman is sir, king of Assyria and Hosea became his servant. How became his servant and gave him presents. So now you see the king of the northern kingdom became a, a servant to Assyria, he became an agent. Right. And gave him presents. And the king of Syria, Assyria, found conspiracy in Hosea, found that he was phony, that he was he, he was up to something. Why? Because remember, the, the, as we pointed out in Isaiah, that uh, the leaders of Judah. Right. Well, actually, not just Judah, but we see also we know that the northern kingdom decided to try to what? Go to Egypt and buddy up with them. We see Judah doing that, but also in this passage, this is referring to uh, the king of the northern kingdom trying to buddy up with the Egyptians. For he sent messages so uh, messages to so king of Egypt and brought no present to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Yeah, he was shysty, right? He tried to circumvent the judgment of the Most High. He tried to enter into an agreement with, he, with the Egyptians and got busted. So then the king of Israel, I mean, Assyria, came up throughout all the land and went up to Samaria, right? Samaria, northern kingdom, territories of the 
northern kingdom. So when you see the term Samaritans and what is called the renewed covenant, think of the northern kingdom family and besiege it. That's where you see Tsar, right? Right? Tsar or Matazar, Tsar or Tazar. Right. This word is the primitive root of what you say would many uh, of the word Matazar Yam or Mitzrayim, which is transliterates to Egypt. It means siege. Matzar or Matazar means siege. Tsar or Tazar means be siege. So guess what? This is still tying into what? The spirit of Egypt. Right. Three years. So the king came up throughout the land and went up to Samaria, put them under siege, the northern kingdom territory, three years. So, again, when you see the story about the Good Samaritan, that is dealing with uh, the northern kingdom. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel into Assyria. Samaria, when it says Israel, northern kingdom, and placed them in Hala. And in har on uh, hab uh, in harbor, excuse me, habor. I say harbor, but habor or habor, however you want to pronounce it, by the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. All right. So when we go to Isaiah twenty-seven, verse twelve and thirteen, go back here. Notice what it says. And it shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh shall beat off the channel of the river up the stream of Egypt. And ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. Right? And it shall come to pass that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship Yahweh in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Oh my gosh, we just came right back to this. So we see the outcast, right? The outcast is referred to who? We just gave the answers. The land of the Assyrians, they took over Samaria. Then we see, as you see, a representative, the king of the northern kingdom, buddy, buddy, with Egypt. And we also see that Judah trying to join and connect with Egypt. All right. So Yahweh has promised to restore Israel and, you know, destroy, restore his people. See, Isaiah predicted that Israel would be set free from the Assyrian and uh, Egyptian exile. Right. But again, some would say the uh, as well as of the Babylonian captivity. But again, I put this here just so I could uh, remember my thought. But again, anyway. But again, guess what? When we read this portion of the passage, the Babylonian captivity didn't happen. That's where we have to be careful. Right. Like I said, I put this thought here so I can remember saying this portion here. Right. The Babylonian captivity, that's incorrect, because in that passage that I highlighted, where's the Babylonian captivity? <laughs> right. Where's the Babylonian captivity? All right. So I, I, I meant to wrong word this differently. Uh, but anyway, but soon after Isaiah's day, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and deported the blood descendants of Israel to other nations. Right. So when we get to the book of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah in Second Kings, and also you could um, read up in this in Chronicles as well. But the book of Jeremiah, Second Kings confirms the Babylonian captivity. So when we go through the Babylonian captivity, when we deal with this uh, particular book now, now you see family why it's, it takes a lot of time. We have to we have to take our time with this. We have to slow walk this thing. We have to slow walk this thing. So let's bring this back. Right. Let's deal with Jeremiah. We just dealt a lot with Isaiah and we got to do more with him in part two, but primarily from the renewed covenant first invasion of Judah and Jerusalem, southern kingdom, by Nebuchadnezzar took place in 605 BC. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 34 through 37 and confirm this. The Pharaoh Nicho, uh, Nicho, or Nicha made 
El Eliakim, right, the son of Josiah king in the room of Josiah, his father, and turned his name into Jehoiakim. Look at what happened here. So the Pharaoh made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, made him king in the room of Josiah's father and turned his name to Jehoiakim and took Jeho Jeho uh, Jehoaz away and he came to Egypt and died there. Think about that family. Think about how much power and this still dealing with what? The Egyptians having power over Israel because Israel gave them that power. So the Pharaoh made Eliakim, the son of Joaz, king of the room, um, um, king in the room, and Josiah the father, and turned his name to Jehoiakim. And now we're dealing with the southern kingdom. And took Jehoaz away, and he came to Egypt and died there. And Jehoiakim gave silver, gave the silver and gold to Pharaoh, and he taxed the land to give the money according to the commandments of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and gold of the people of the land of everyone according to his taxation. So you see that Israel, basically Judah, right? It would we'll just say Israel as a whole, they're in bondage to Israel again. I mean, to Egypt again. Isn't this crazy family? Isn't this crazy? You see that as we pointed out in Isaiah, because you see Assyria and Egypt is mentioned. And I know some of you guys were saying, wait a minute. I thought Israel was already delivered from Egypt. But we see that the Most High has to deliver them again from Egypt. Because of what did they do? They began to enter into agreements with Egypt and they are now in bondage to the Egyptians. Look at the control the Egyptians have on them. And Jehoiakim, right, got his name from Pharaoh, gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give the money according to the commandments of Pharaoh. So what he did was he uh, raised the taxes in order to give Pharaoh his gift. He exacted the silver and gold of the people of the land and of everyone according to his taxation to give it unto uh, Pharaoh. Nicole, Jehoiakim was 20 and five years old when he began to reign and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Zebuda, right? Uh, I'm thinking of Zamunda, right? Zebuda, the daughter of Pediah and Ruma, or excuse me, of Ruma. So, and he died, or excuse me, and he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, according to all that his fathers had done. So Jehoiakim was placed on the throne by Egypt and had the same, or excuse me, had his name changed by Pharaoh uh, Necho, changed from Eliakim to Jehoiakim, right? By forcing a name change, Pharaoh Necho was indicating Egypt's dominance and a mark of Jehoiakim's subjection. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned for a term of 11 years under the domination of Egypt. So Jehoiakim lived a very wicked life. Instead of following in the way of the righteous steps of his father Josiah, he followed the example of the wicked kings who had ruled before him. Jehoiakim surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar. Judah became a vassal, vassal state to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar allowed Jehoiakim to remain in power as a puppet king. Wow, you see what's going on here? <laughs> he was an agent, the mentorian candidate. Right. You guys know what the Manchurian candidate is. So that's basically what Jehoiakim was. He got his name from the Pharaoh Egypt and now he's a puppet for Nebuchadnezzar. Right. And I explain that uh, some of that here, get going a little further with that. But we'll, you know, we'll do a separate teaching on this because some of this stuff you have to go into in-depth teachings to get clarity. So second Kings chapter 24, verse one through four. Notice what you see here. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim 
became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against them. And Yahweh sent against him bands of the Chaldees. So guess what? Making it clear, Jehoiakim, right? Judah cannot escape the judgment. So what did Yahweh do? He sent him bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, and bands of Moabites, bands of the children of Ammon, and sent them against Judah to destroy it, to, to, to knock down his rebellion and try to get out of this judgment, to circumvent the judgment, according to the word of Yahweh, which he spake by his servants, right? The, uh, the prophets, surely at the commandment of Yahweh came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did. Verse four, and also for the innocent blood that he had shed, right? He shed for the, uh, for the, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which Yahweh would not pardon. He was a, he was a wicked king family. So for three years, Jehoiakim willingly subjected himself and paid the annual tribute to Nebuchadnezzar, right? Dealing with the first invasion, he foolishly rebelled because Egypt had launched a surprise attack against the army of Babylon and defeated them in a major battle. Sensing that he could now throw off the yoke of Babylon, Jehoiakim turned to the Egyptians to form an alliance. Nebuchadnezzar, needing to rebuild his army, had to wait some time to put down that uprising, which leads me to the second invasion, because most people don't know that there was multiple invasions, three invasions. So the second invasion of Judah and Jerusalem occurred in 597 B.C., when Nebuchadnezzar took 10,000 Israelites, mostly skilled workers, to Babylon. And this is where you start getting into Daniel. The first chapter of Daniel. Right. So to confirm this, let's go to Second Kings 24, verse eight through 14. Notice what it says. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign uh, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. And his mother named uh, Nahushta, uh, the daughter of uh, El Nathan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem and the city was besieged. Now we see Matazar, uh, Matazawar or Matsar, right? Uh, someone's pronouncing Matsor. But anyway, that's Israeli. But Matazar, War or Matsar. Right. Either way. But they're still dealing with siege, besiege. Right. That still ties into what? Egypt's name. Right. So Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the Babel, uh, king of Babylon and he and his mother and his servants, his princes, his officers and the kings of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of Yahweh and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of Yahweh, as Yahweh had said. Notice how he ramshacked everything. He carried away all. Notice what he says. He carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and the smiths. Right. You know, dealing with the um, blacksmiths. None remain save the poorest sort of the people of the land. Left them in total destitute. Right. To made the, I mean, tried it down. Just left what the poor, the, the those that didn't have any type of value to them. Right. Doesn't that sound familiar? So Jeremiah chapter 22, right, confirms this verse 4, 24 through 30. Notice what it says here. As I live, saith Yahweh, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, yet I would pluck thee thence. Oh, my goodness. Most high took the authority right away from him. 
that signet ring, that is what that's the signature of a king. And I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life, into the hand of them whose face thou, thou fearest, even into the land of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hands of Chaldeans. And I will cast thee out and thy mother that bear thee into another country where ye were not born, and there shall ye die. But to the land whereunto they desire to return, thither shall they not return. Is this man, Coniah, a despised, broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, and he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? O earth, earth, earth. Notice it says it three times. Earth, earth, earth. The third letter of the Hebrew, Alabayat, is the Gamal. Notice what this says here. Hear the word of Yahweh. Earth, earth, earth. Everyone, right? Hear the word. Shama'ai. Listen with intelligence. Be obedient. Discern the word Dabar, Yahweh. Thus saith Yahweh, write ye this man childless. A man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. I encourage you guys to watch the lesson in the foundational playlist titled The Son of a Cursed King. And that answers the question because non-Messianic brews and even those from the Jewish community would say, well, wait a minute. How's the Messiah out of the lineage of this person here? Watch that lesson. I explain it by way of giving you proper clarity of Zerubbabel. I'm not going to give you the answer here, but watch that lesson and I give you the answer there. All right. So for no man, his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Right. So in that day, a king wore a signet ring as a symbol of his authority. He pressed upon on he pressed its imprints on legal documents to show that the papers were official and that the king's authority stood behind the document. Right. So part of the second evasion, because King Jehoiakim's evil lifestyle. Yahweh said that he would take away the king of uh, the king's, uh, you know, Yah given authority. Which both Jehoiakim and his mother, the queen, would be handed over to the king Nebuchadnezzar and exiled to Babylon. Jehoiakim would never return to the promised land. Like a broken, useless pot, he would be a king that no one wanted. Three times Jeremiah called on the land to hear the word of Yahweh. None of his sons would succeed him on the throne, which meant that he would be the last of the uh, uh, kings of Judah, the Judean kings. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon would place Zedekiah, Joachim's uncle, upon the throne. He put Jehoiakim's uncle on the throne, Zedekiah. Right. So again, Yahweh, excuse the order of this, the animations off. Yahweh would also treat Jehoiakim as if he had no seeds. He had children. But basically, in a nutshell, this is where you start getting into him just completely stripping his authority. So let's talk about the third invasion. I know I know I'm giving you guys a lot of information. I know I am giving you guys a lot of information. That's why I say I have to slow walk this thing. Right. Just to make sure you guys understand. Right. Right. I, 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 that's why I say I don't I don't get with this second exodus. I don't get with many of these terms. What I get with, of course, is the gathering. Now, we can go to the scriptures and see that there was a number of gatherings of Israel. But that's a whole nother discussion. Right. Pretty much every time Israel uh, got into a captivity, they had to gather. Right. That's a whole nother discussion. But we still going to give clarity. Jeremiah, we're going to stay within Jeremiah uh, and um, touch on Ezekiel more. in lesson number two, but we're, we're going to really come from the angle of the renewed covenant to confirm some questions here that I asked here. All right. So let's continue. 
So the third invasion of Judah and Jerusalem occurred in 586 BC. During this time, the temple was burned and the city destroyed. Almost all remaining inhabitants was, was raptured to Babylon. Yeah, I know what rapture means. It means kidnapped. They was abducted to Babylon, right? Here's the etymology of the word rapture, act of carrying off, seizure, rape, kidnapping, a carrying off, abduction, snatching away, rape, okay? So let's go to Jeremiah 39, verse 1 and 2. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the 10th month came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. And, and in the 11th year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. Right? The city was broken up. The city was broken up. So the question is, how many Israelites chose to return? And why was there a need for a second sweep? When did it occur? Right? What is the wilderness? That's another question we got to answer. What did the Messiah say about the gathering? And guess what, family? We're going to stop right here because I think I gave you more than enough to go off of in part one. I think I gave you more than enough to go off of in part one. We're going to stop right here. I'm going to drop the link inside the comment section. Right. I gave you a lot of information. We got a lot to confirm in part two. That's why I say we got to take our time and go through this. You know, we can't um, do a quick walk through this. We can't do a quick walk. We can't piecemeal. We have to go uh, as we as we teach it. We have to make sure that we rightly divide this word of truth. A workman need not be ashamed but rightly divide, dividing the word of truth. I know I, I know I kind of left you at a cliffhanger, but guess what? We got a lot more to cover. We had to break this up in two, but this would easily be a five hour, six hour teaching. So I hope this has blessed you. Uh, and let me check the, the um, cash app. Let's see if anyone else contributed. All right, let me refresh this to, just to make sure. All right. I want to say peace and blessings for uh, Sister Karen. Uh, actually, Copper Queen K is actually uh, her name here. Uh, thank you for, uh, in other words, for this lesson. Appreciate you, sis. Thank you for the love and support from Copper Queen K. Thank you. Appreciate it. And family, uh, if you want to uh, send a cash app, the cash app is in is pinned to the top of the chat. If you want to send a cash app to support what we're doing here, feel free to do so. And um, again, I dropped a link there uh, for anyone that jumps on. Please stay on topic because I really don't want to get into anything that's not going to deal with what we just covered tonight. All right want to keep it simple. Okay. So with that being said, let me go ahead and um, do a couple of things here. All right. Again, I know this was a lot of information, but I purposely went through uh, the way that I went through it just to touch on some things that you have heard and give you proper clarity, give you scripture. So again, for those that may have the question that jumped on late, for me, I don't believe we should use the word Exodus or second Exodus. We, sh we should simply say the regathering. Why? Because when you go through each one of these books, you start seeing things a lot clearer. Right. You see things clear. You see the moving parts. You get to really understand what the prophets were referring to in what times. The timelines and everything. We start understanding what captivities these prophets were in. It makes a world of a difference, family. It really makes a world of a difference. You know, and as I proved to you, 
hey, I'm not saying that we're not going to be regathered. I'm going to let you hear from the the, the most uh, highest mouth, which we already heard some, but we're going to touch on it more. But we're going to let the Messiah give you clarity on how we should interpret the prophecies of the prophets. We're going to use revelation. We're going to use some of what Apostle Paul taught on to give you clarity on exactly what Paul touched on to make sure that we put in the prophecy, the prophecies in the proper order, the proper sequence and the proper perspective, free from the influence of the Roman Catholic Church. All right. Free from the influence of our oppressors, because many of us, whether we in the church or outside the church, we're still interpret interpreting these uh, the prophecies, even just descriptions, even how to love one another from the lens of our oppressors. We shouldn't do that, family. We should not do that. Our oppressors cannot teach us how to love. Our, pre our oppressors cannot teach us how to uh, repent. They can't teach us. Man, when when the true <laughs> this, the true blood descendants of Israel really study this word, you'll see why in the book of Psalms you see that the Most High did not talk to any other nations but Israel. Gave his revelations to Israel. It's in our DNA family. Can no one teach it like we teach it? Especially when we grab hold of it, can no one teach it like we teach it? That's a fact. No one can teach this text like we can teach it. All right. So I really appreciate it, family. I don't see anyone jumping on. So I'm not going to hold you up here. Uh, again, I appreciate you guys for jumping on here. Let's see how what we're looking at as far as the likes and subscribe. So I encourage you guys, if you haven't uh, subscribed to the channel, click the like and subscribe to the channel. And let's see where we are real quick before we wrap up. Let's get those likes. Let's get those likes. Where, where we are right now. Where we at right now. Let's see. All right. We are at. 284 now we just 16 shy of 300 so let's let's do this before i wrap up right it doesn't cost anything to hit that like button let's get those likes up to 300 let's get 300 likes before we conclude here family let's get 300 likes and you know let's get those thumbs up let's get let's hit 300 before i wrap up all right we still have over over 300 people here, almost 350 people here in this live. Let's get it up. Let's get let's get those lives up. Let's get it from 284. Let's we we should be able to do that pretty quick. It's just a simple click, right? Let's let's get it up here, fam. Let's see if we can get it over 300 before I wrap up. All right, that's that's the least we could do, right? In support of what we're doing here, let's get those let's get those um those those thumbs up. All right. Because we have uh, more than enough to get uh, 16 more likes here. All right. Let me refresh this here. All right. Let's see here. All right. Let's see where we are right now. All right. Let's see where we are right now. There we go, family. We had 300. We had 300. You can keep it going, but we had 300. So when you participate like this, this uh, really keeps us kind of kind of breaks that algorithm that really makes a world of a difference of how the algorithm rep recognize what we're doing over here. All right. Really appreciate you, family. And uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Right. We're really going to wrap up here. And thank you guys. Thank the moderators for uh, for the love and support. And family also too. Thanks, thank my uh, my brother Yah son. Yes, we just short of forty one thousand subs, right? In spite of all the shadow banning and everything, we are still growing. Uh, so right now, I believe. Let me look here. Let me look at the subscribers here. Uh, I think we are. Let's see where we are. How short are we? 
we're at 908 right we still need to get another uh 100 and technically we got 100 subs here right if you're not subscribed to the channel let's get those subs up let's try to get it up to uh 41 000. if if we can't do it tonight let's get it as close as we can hit that like right subscribe to the channel and also make sure you hit that notification button all right many uh haven't hit that notification button um and sometimes you have to do it multiple times because i proved that youtube will unclick it right unselect it for you right without you even asking them to do it all right so but with that being said family i don't want to sound like um i'm begging here either but uh i just encourage you guys subscribe to the channel and if you have any questions put it inside the comment section even though the video is getting ready, ready to end, the teaching is going to end. But guess what? Your participation can continue, right? In the words of Moses, Masha, in the words of Masha, Moses, given to him by way of the Most High, Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. Fear ye not, stand still, see the salvation of Yahweh. These Egyptians that you see here today, you will never have to deal with them again. They will not have power over you ever again. The Most High will fight for you. But here's the kicker, family. You have to hold your peace. Can't go back. Can't stay here. Keep moving forward. Shalom. Listen. Genesis chapter 11, verse 10. Explains the genealogy of Shem. Shem was a black man. In Africa, if you repeat this back, Genesis 14, verse 13, Abraham steps on the scene. Being a descendant of Shem, which is a fact, means Abraham too was black. Abraham, born in the city of a black man, called Nimrod, grandson of Ham. Ham had four sons. One was named Cain. Here, let me do some explaining. Abraham. Isaac was the father. Jacob had 12 sons for real. And these were the children of Israel. According to Genesis chapter 10, these were the children of Israel. According to Genesis chapter 10.